If you have metal detected for any length of time, chances are you know what this is, especially if you get opportunities to detect on 1800s or earlier home sites. I've done presentations for local organizations, and usually when I show these and ask if anyone knows what they are, there is a room full of silence. This is how they are usually found, but here is a more intact example. And this item as well usually stumps people. Even those who metal detect are sometimes confused by these. There is the smallest of hints as to what this is right in the photo. To understand what these are, and what is much more an interesting question, why we find these when we metal detect, we need to peel back the layers of time. From our present day, we have to go back to a time before smartphones. For most of us, this isn't too hard to imagine. Apple released the iPhone in 2007. As early as 2001, you could get a phone with internet access, but the data costs were too steep for most people. But you would have to go back all the way to 1992 to find the first touchscreen smartphone. IBM released the Simon Personal Communicator. It could send emails and faxes, it had calendars, even predictive keyboard text. We would have to go back before the internet. January 1st, 1983 is often cited as the birth date of the internet, but there's a long history of communications and networking of computers prior to 1983. It wasn't until the mid-90s when most people started to take notice and use the internet. When I was in college, I used a network called BitNet, which stood for Because It's Their Network. It was a network set up between colleges. I could email my friend in Boston from Pennsylvania, which was revolutionary for me at the time. The network relied on one modem opening from one campus to another, and it would push the emails and information through. Often emails would take several days to reach my friend. You could see the various hops it made on its journey once you received it. Often it would bounce across the United States until it landed at just the right spot. And we still need to go back further. We have to go back before TV. All the versions that have existed from our large flat screens to the consoles built into furniture to black and white and all the way to 1927 when the first successful demonstration of a TV was conducted. We need to go back to the 1890s when some of the first radio communications have been sent and received. And before that, to 1877, when the first phonograph was invented. And don't forget, at this time, most homes would not have electricity. While we could argue that all of these devices enable us to connect with and inform one another, they all keep us entertained, allow us to escape reality, and in some ways become their own reality. It's hard to imagine giving all this up now that it's here and fully integrated in our lives. But in the late 1800s and earlier, you had no choice. You were grateful to have a well that produced water, even if you had to retrieve it one bucket at a time outdoors. You were thankful that your land provided your family food throughout the entire year. You were excited by the advancements being made in lanterns, allowing the fuel to burn cleaner and brighter allowing you to see throughout your home on the coldest and darkest of winter days. When I pull artifacts out of the ground at a 17 or 1800s home site, I get just the smallest glimpse of what their lives were like. We find farm-related equipment, horseshoes and axes. We find the common necessities, silverware and lamp parts. But what did people do in the 1800s to entertain themselves? Certainly, they would have read. Jane Austen, Emily Bronte, Charles Dickens, and Mark Twain, just to name a few, were all publishing works in the 1800s. In the North, literacy jumped from 75 to as high as 97%, and in the South, 55 to 81%, between the years of 1800 and 1840. So it is highly likely that reading was a source of entertainment. I do wonder how practical it would be to read by lamplight, how easy it was to obtain new books, or to get reading glasses as your close-up vision starts to fail. Perhaps you reread books in your collection when nothing new is available. But these small strips of brass that we find are directly tied to the entertainment in 1800s. If you are still wondering what this is, it is a harmonica reed. 
Actually, it is a reed holder. In the 1820s, the harmonica was invented, and their popularity spread quickly. If you think about what a harmonica provides, it makes sense to have become commonly used. They are small and very portable. They don't take much skill to use. Sure, you may not be able to immediately play a recognizable song the first time you pick it up, but you will be able to play all the notes in its range, unlike a trumpet, which takes some practice just to play one note. What we typically don't find metal detecting is the actual reeds, the thin piece of metal that would vibrate as wind crosses over and makes the sound we are familiar with. You can see a very small point where the reed would have been fused to the holder. Most harmonicas make use of two reed holders. One plays notes while the user exhales, and the other while they inhale. I have one example where it appears there was only one reed holder, as you can see the alternating points where the reeds attached. I've done a bit of research and up until now haven't found out more about this particular style to confirm my suspicion. And so this last piece that I've shown you earlier is related. It too is a reed holder missing the reed. This is an accordion reed holder, or possibly from a squeeze box or concertina. Again, one could pick up and start playing one of these instruments, but it would take much more practice and perhaps some lessons to ever play music. After a few years of use, the reeds can go out of tune. With a harmonica, the cheapest and most practical solution is to discard and buy a new one. That's probably why we find so many. On the other hand, with an accordion, one can replace the reeds. This is why we see on most of these holders a note stamped to assist with replacing the correct reed in the correct location. I can easily envision a family sitting in a lamp-lit room singing while someone plays a squeeze box, or someone takes a break from working the fields under the shade of a tree and they start playing a small tune on their harmonica.